Thank awesome. you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm starting first class, Selena Madam. I'm a horn player with the US Army Field Band. You see two of my other colleagues here today. Um, we're gonna be sharing a little bit about life in military music. Um, but before I get to that, I just wanna give you guys like a little overview of who I am and my background, um, and also some really great resources that I've come across um, in the past couple of years um, as a female brass player, uh, as a woman in the military, um, and as someone who's really big into the marching arts, that's been a huge part of my musical background. So um, the quick version, I did an undergraduate degree at Furman University in music education. Uh, and then I went straight into a master's degree at Indiana in French horn performance and wind conducting. Um, after that, I actually took a job with a Broadway show that toured in Japan for a couple of months. So I was a stage performer, um, stage musician with the show called Brass Odyssey that was in Japan in 2008. Very weird glittery costumes and makeup and mellophones and marching drums and uh, kind of like Blast, if any of you guys have ever seen the musical Blast. It was one of the more interesting jobs of my career. Um, and when that show finished up, I uh, worked some retail jobs, did the Starbucks make your coffee thing, taught some private lessons. You know, we, we all have those jobs that are kind of our in-between jobs and uh, had a great time working retail. A lot of friends that I still keep in touch with from my days at uh, Starbucks and Banana Republic. Um, yeah, and then I, uh, I had my teaching certificate from my undergraduate. And so I actually ended up teaching full-time as a high school and elementary school band director in South Carolina. I did that for two years um, and then decided to go back to school, pursue a doctorate with the goal of becoming a college professor, teaching French horn at the collegiate level. Um, while I was doing my doctorate at Colorado, uh, I was teaching part-time at a high school there and I was looking into some college jobs and kind of, you know, didn't, didn't feel right. And I was like, well, maybe I don't want to do this whole college teaching thing. Um, so I started taking a lot of military band auditions and I auditioned for every branch of service um, more than once, most of them. And I auditioned for every premier band in the DC area. You know, those of you who live close by, you know that we have all, you know, the Navy band and the Army field band, the Army band, the Marine band, um, you know, the Navy Academy band down in Annapolis. I think I took an audition for every single one of those groups uh, and many of them twice or three times uh, before earning a spot with the Army field band. And I've been in this group for six years now and uh, like it very much. I think I'm going to stay here and kind of finish out my, my career as a musician here. Um, but kind of intermixed in, in that timeline of, uh, you know, my professional life, as it were, um, I, I am a person who kind of grew up in marching band. Um, my parents are both high school band directors in Georgia. They were my high school band directors. So they were Mr. and Miss Adams, but they were mom and dad to me. Um, so my sister and I like literally grew up in play pens in the back of a band room, which is a really unique experience. Um, you know, sometimes I, I talk to my husband, who's also a musician, and he, his parents are non-musical. They don't, they don't do music at all. So for him, when I share some stories, he's like, I don't understand. Like, you're practicing at home and your mom's calling out like from the kitchen, like, are you sure that's a B natural? I th I'm not sure that's a B natural. It's just a, you know, it's a different, it's a different way to grow up. Um, but, you know, marching band is such a big thing um, in the South where I grew up, marching band football. Uh, so I, I really kind of fell in love with that. I learned how to play the mellophone. I was in high school marching band, college marching band, and then I got into drum corps. I marched with uh, the cadets drum corps for four years, uh, won a couple championships, DCI and all that kind of fun stuff. And that was my first experience as a teacher as well, was teaching in marching band programs. When I was in college, I would go teach band camps for high school band programs and stuff that were nearby. Um, and so it was really my first experiences with how to be a teacher were teaching marching band as opposed to maybe teaching private lessons or, or actually teaching a band class of my own. Um, so I think that that was kind of a, a, an interesting way to kind of get into teaching because um, you're not too much older than your students. You know, if you're a college student, you're a sophomore or a junior in college and you're teaching high school kids, they're three or four years younger than you if you're lucky. Um, so it was a, a, a neat way to kind of figure out, you know, how do I act professional? How do I share information with these people that are very near peer age for me? Um, but I, I had a lot of fun doing that. 
Um, and in the marching arts, you know, those of you who are kind of into marching band and things like that, there aren't a ton of female, um, females in charge, I guess I should say. There are a ton of females that are involved in the marching arts. Um, of course, the color guard world is actually female dominated, which is, which is kind of interesting. Not a ton of females, you know, in the drumline world, there's a couple of percussion caption heads and stuff in, in DCI and DCA. Uh, not a ton of female caption heads in DCI, DCA, or even women who are in charge of drum corps or head band directors, like high school head band directors of big marching band programs, just typically are guys. Um, but I think one of the one of the neatest things that I experienced uh, coming up as a young music educator and then as a performer is that it only really takes one person to impact your life in, in such a, a deep way. Um, and for me, I had one female mellophone instructor that was just the coolest teacher, the greatest teacher. And I had one female visual instructor when I was in a, a drum corps that was just, you know, they knew the, all the answers. Like any problem I had, she knew the answer. She could help me fix it. And those two ladies kind of, you know, not to say that you, you can't do anything because you're a woman. Of course, you can do whatever you want. But when you see someone who's in that position of power or someone who seems to have all the answers and you're able to form a mentorship relationship with them, it really makes all the difference, you know? Um, and I, I think those of you, especially who are women or, you know, from an underrepresented category in whatever way, um, but also our, our males in music, if you're able to help inspire someone who's coming after you, be it one of your students or even someone who's just a couple years behind you in school, and you're able to help show them opportunities that they can take advantage of, it's huge, right? Like it's absolutely the most important thing we can do as musicians and as music teachers is to help that generation after us be able to experience the things that we have and maybe not have some of those barriers or be able to meet those barriers and step over them easier than maybe we were able to. Um, so with that in mind, I actually wanted to share with you guys a couple of really interesting resources uh, and, and groups that I, I was not aware of, I guess, when I was a college student, even, or even a master's student, like I just didn't know these things existed. And once I found out that they existed, I formed some really amazing relationships with the people in these groups and what they're able to offer um, to young musicians and music teachers. So I'm going to share my screen here, see if I can make this happen. There we go. Um, so the first one here, let me get this out of the way so I can fiddle around. Um, so this, uh, and we were heard, is kind of a, um, I, I won't say it's like a consortium, it's not a consortium, uh, it's kind of a consortium thing. Basically, their their mission is to have a number of composers from underrepresented categories, including, you know, female, LGBTQ, um, different nationalities, things like that. This website is just one of the coolest resources that I found as a music teacher and as a band director. Um, they have a lot of really interesting facts here. And then this organization is actually actively helping commission these composers, get their works performed, recorded, published, and available for purchase by band directors all over the, all over the globe. Um, so they talk a little bit about, you know, the Texas list here. 1.8% um, of the works by composers of color, 2.8% of the works by white females, and no works at all by female composers of color. Like when you think of how big Texas as a state is in the, in the concert band world, in the marching band world, um, it's kind of crazy, right? And so this this group is is really actively working on trying to uh, get these pieces out there because there's so many composers of such a diverse background that are writing music, and they might just not have the connections to get it published, get it performed, get it recorded, and get it into the hands of people who actually want to play the music. Um, so if you have a chance, I, I definitely check this out. Um, one of my friends uh, is very involved with this project. Her name's Caitlin Bobay. She's a band director out at a small college. Uh, on the West Coast, um, and we were heard.org. I highly rep recommend taking a look through their database of music and recordings if you're ever looking to program um, some some concerts. It's just absolutely great, great stuff. Uh, so that's that's one resource there. Um, the second one here is the International Women's Brass Conference. And how many of you guys are brass players? Like show of hands, brass players. Hey, there you are. Yep, <laughs> cool. Um, so this is a group that I was interest, introduced to um, my senior year in college, and it is, it's just a group of women brass players. And you're like, okay, yeah, there's lots of women brass players. 
20 or 30 years ago, there were not very many women brass players in professional orchestras, professional military bands. Um, you just, you know, they were out there, but they were few and far between. So they, they formed this organization to really have a community where people can, can talk about the things that they're dealing with, get together. They have a big conference once a year. Um, and some of the most famous, you know, women brass players of our generation are very heavily involved in this. Um, they do offer scholarships not only to females, but also to males um, for collegiate study, for summer programs. Um, they're very involved with commissioning pieces of music. Um, again, not just by female composers, but just great brass music, quintets and brass choirs and all kinds of things like that. So um, for those of you who are brass players and those of you who are music educator, you know, music education majors and looking to be teachers, I really recommend you check out this website as a resource as well. It's huge. Um, here in the Baltimore area, every December, the Baltimore chapter of the IWBC hosts a huge holiday concert at the St. Mary's Cathedral up in like North Baltimore, it's north of the city. It's, it looks like a castle, like it's this giant Catholic church, um, but they host a big holiday concert there and I've played in it the past couple of years. It's basically the who's who of female brass players from all the DC military bands, you know, the NSO, the BSO. All the orchestras in town they bring in some guest artists and it's a bunch of really fun holiday music and all the proceeds from that concert go into our scholarship fund to help provide scholarships um, for those of you who are studying at collegiate level um, grad school level or doing any kind of summer program you know nro aspen things like that so hopefully we'll have one this year we don't really know what's going on with that but uh you know keep an eye out for that it happens usually the first week of december right after thanksgiving it's a lot of fun come say hi to me i'll be there playing french horn somewhere um, so that's a really great resource especially again for our for our brass players and then uh moving into my my favorite musical area the marching arts here um there's there's two really great resources that have come up uh in the past couple years that i just think are, are huge especially again you know not just those of you who are females as performers but those of you who are music educators it's great to be able to give your female students these resources and say hey you might be the only girl drummer in our drum line right now but you are not the only girl drummer in the world there are others right and i'm sure michelle can tell you all about that it's it's not it's you know it's not that you're put down in any way but sometimes if you grew up in a small school like i was one of two girl french horn players in my school because there were just two of us you know there was only one girl trumpet player and like one girl trombone player no girl tuba players, no girl drummers. That's just, you know, that's where we were. It was a small school in South Georgia. Like, that's just where we were. But it's, you're not the only one, you know? And so to be able to, to send them to some of these resources and they can see, oh, there's all these other people that love what I love and do what I do. It's really cool. Um, Girlsmarch.org uh, is kind of focused on women and specifically marching percussion, um, but also women in marching band, women in DCI, DCA, uh, drum corps and things like that. Uh, a lot of the people involved with this organization are really um, some amazing band directors and people involved with drum corps. Um, you know, Joni Perez, who's the head band director of the Woodlands High School out in Texas. Um, Sandy Rennick, you know, is really involved with this organization. And Andrea Brown, who's uh, one of the band directors down at UMD, right here in our backyard, uh, is heavily involved with this program as well. So that's a cool one. Uh, and then the last is the INSTEP program, which is the Women of DCI, for those of you who are drum corps fans. This is a pretty new organization. Um, they only started it up a couple years back. Um, but again, it's, it's really a, a neat way to kind of check in with other ladies in our business and, and see what they're up to. They're, they're trying to make sure that, you know, women who are excited about the marching arts have the opportunity to meet other women who are excited about the marching arts, which is huge. So I uh, just wanted to throw that out there as a, as a resource as well. Um, so that's, I guess that's kind of what I really wanted to share. Um, it's not so much, you know, I don't have any brilliant <laughs> things to, to make anything easy for anyone. Um, I definitely agree with, uh, with what both Leslie and Michelle said. You never really know where your path is gonna take you um, as far as your career, you know? And I, I, as the children of band directors, I was going to be a band director. Like I was going to teach high school band for 30 years and then retire. And like, that was going to be the plan. Um, and it was a great plan and I liked it for a little while. Um, but I think you also have to, to be real about, you know, at some point, if your plan isn't serving you 
and what you're doing isn't what you want to be doing or it doesn't feel right. Um, for me, my work-life balance was not really great when I was a high school band director. Um, I was very unhealthy. I did not eat well. I did not sleep well. I did not exercise. Um, now I'm in the army, so I fixed all those problems. <laughs> um, but you know, you, you have to kind of evaluate. Uh, sometimes it's like, okay, well, I have a paycheck and I have a job. That's great. But if it's not really the job that you feel like you need, um, you know, you have to be okay with with letting it go and maybe trying something new. And that can be scary, right? That can be super scary to be like, I'm not coming back next year. I'm gonna walk away from this beautiful paycheck and like health insurance and I'm gonna go do this other thing. Um, but you know, sometimes we can take those risks and, uh, and, and just know that it is a risk and you think it's gonna be a risk that's gonna get you to something that's better. Um, you can't always be afraid of that. So I think kind of having uh, some courage to, you know, do what your parents not <laughs> told you not to do. Like, why are you quitting your job? I'm like, well, I hate my job, so I'm gonna go do something else. That's okay. That's okay to do sometimes. Um, and then also, you know, finding those mentors in your life and finding those people that um, can help you through that process. You know, okay, I'm going to quit my teaching job. What now? You know, um, I was lucky enough to have some really great applied professors, uh, horn teachers, um, who not only taught me things, but I was able to teach them things in return. Um, the person I studied with in Colorado, Mike Thornton, was like super anti-marching band everything when I first got there and I was like oh word this is not going to work out well for you because I love the mellophone um so there was a you know there was a give and take there where he he came to my side a little bit and understood that I was paid money for six months to play French horn and mellophone in a Broadway show in Japan and he was like I didn't even know that was a thing I was like yes that's a thing people that's that's a legitimate way of making money in a music industry um, and since then, he kind of sends me students every once in a while. I was like, hey, I've got this student that wants to audition for a drum corps. Can you help her out? I was like, yes, sure. I'm happy to do that. Uh, and, you know, and then he also taught me, of course, amazing things on French horn as one of the reasons I have the job that I have today. So I think it's, it's great to find those mentors that you can, you can share things with. And, you know, as much as we learn from them, they learn from us as well. And that's always a really special relationship. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I have for you guys. I know uh, both of our Sarahs over here are going to talk some more about life in the military band and our unit. It's so nice to see their faces. We haven't been going into work during most of this, so I haven't actually seen them face to face in quite some time. Um, but yeah, does anybody have any questions for me before I turn it back over? Everybody good? All right. Great. All right, Jacqueline, do I need to give this back to you? Are you still? Yes. <laughs> I hand the host back over, I guess. I don't know how to do that. But I have a question for you. Yes. One that I asked Leslie. Um, what composer style or genre do you listen to to find inspiration? such a tricky question, right? It's such a tricky question because it's, it's different depending on what I'm doing. You know, if I'm working on French horn stuff, of course, I just want to listen to Mahler all day long because that's, you know, why would you not? Um, but what I, what I listen to kind of in my personal time, um, when, I, when I exercise, I actually listen to a lot of drum corps because it's, it's marching band music. It has a steady tempo. So like if you're running to it and you need to be running at 170 beats a minute, there's a marching band show for that, right? So I know that sounds really stupid, but that's what works. I also listen to a ton of um, salsa music, like salsa and reggaeton music. That's kind of my personal, if I'm in the car, it's like on the Hispanic radio station, like that's what's going on. Um, I have a lot of friends that I learned to salsa dance with uh, in college and grad school. And I think um, those styles of music, you know, the French horn is probably the most boring brass instrument. It sounds lovely, but like all we do is classical music, right? There's French horn, you got orchestra, ballet, wind band, that's it. We don't play salsa music, we don't play jazz music, we don't play in pop music. So, you know, there's trumpet players that get to do all that kind of stuff. But I think having a little more awareness of kind of what my instrument doesn't do informs what I can do on my instrument. And if I do get a chance to play some kind of movie soundtrack or, you know, some kind of pop music stuff, which we do with the military band especially, we play all kinds of genres. And so having 
knowledge of like the music I listen to, you know, in my personal life, I guess, kind of informs my professional playing, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, I don't really, I know it sounds bad. Like don't, don't tell my teachers. I don't listen to a ton of classical music these days. I really don't. Um, it's kind of a, a special occasion thing, you know, once a year, my husband and I will sit down and listen to Mahler too, because it's great. But, um, you know, that's, that's, that's not my day to day music listening, I guess. Anybody else? Everybody good? I still don't see where it says that I'm the host. I don't know how to give it back to you. I'm sorry. So 